sunshine and technology, the two things for which the Golden State is renowned. Californians consume 40% less energy per person than the national average and are developing the largest solar power plant in the world. At this one, on the edge of the Mojave Desert, 24,000 mirrors focus sunlight on two towers. They create steam to drive electricity generating turbines, enough to power 4,000 homes. It's a fairly intense light. It's uh, probably the whitest light that, uh, that I've ever seen. We do get quite a few people that come off the highway and, uh, and you'll see them come and stop at the front gate and, and uh, wonder what's going on here. California gets almost 11% of its electricity from renewables and aims to raise this to a third by 2020. It's the most aggressive target in the nation. The technology they're developing here could one day help places like Mumbai to go the green way too. Renewable energy is a, is a significant part of, uh, of the puzzle of how we supply our, our uh, society and, and civilization going forward. So it's, uh, it's definitely a, one of the key, key issues to be resolved in the next 50 years is uh, how we're going to continue to to power this lifestyle that we have, uh, both for us and developing countries. Hitching the environmental wagon to the latest technological marvel is one of the ways this state hopes to be able to accelerate through the problem of climate change. We have to improve our technology at a much faster rate because the political feasibility in L.A. or pretty much anywhere else in the world of de-developing and going backwards in terms of consumption is not too high. So there's a constant eye on the prize, progressive mentality in California that as we invent our way out of the problem, we're also going to get rich because we're going to have a product to sell that everybody else doesn't have and they will need. There's a strong belief in Los Angeles that science will help it heal the changing climate and at the same time hit the jackpot. But time is marching on. While LA relies on technology, it also believes in luck. And there are some who think it's running out. They believe that every option needs to be explored if we are to give our cities a future. Even if that means thinking the unthinkable and getting Angelinos out of their cars. Regrettably, today, most people don't equate the thing that they're doing right now, which is driving on a freeway to their job or to pick up a, a child or to, to go to a store. They don't equate that with CO2 emissions and therefore with climate change and their own viability. As soon as we can make that connection to people much more vivid, I think, will they start to uh, change their habits. Liz Mu is an architect who wants to rework the region's urban fabric and rethink the network on which cities are built. Her practice has worked across the city. Their latest project is in a suburb of LA called Lancaster. The place where John Wayne spent his childhood runs on a very different type of horsepower today. Lancaster is a bedroom suburb of Los Angeles. So Los Angeles from here, driving about 70 or 80 miles on the freeway, which would be a hefty clip, is almost an hour and a half, two hours away from here. It shares the fate of so many American suburbs, a place from which to commute. Its high street morphed into a freeway. You know, the entire land use pattern is based on the use of the private automobile. So typically you've got business districts at the center of the city and people living in the suburbs and commuting long distances. Now to be able to change that about is going to take time. I don't see that happening overnight, but that's something they've, that you've got to embark on with a sense of urgency.
We have to start redesigning places like this because we need to bring people back into more compact, pedestrian-oriented uh, living environments that are close to transit. At the heart of Lancaster's future redesign is dense development linking the high street with the train station. Transit is something the city as a whole is heavily investing in. In the last two decades, LA has spent $8 billion on five new rail lines. 300,000 people now take the train every day, and it's a number on the rise. But it's still nothing compared to Mumbai. Here, tracks rather than roads connect the country. The question is, for how long? If you were to compare Mumbai with LA, the one thing that separates the two cities in terms of their climate impact is the fact that we have a public transport system here. The tragedy is that we are trying to wean them away from such public transport and telling them, buy a car today. It's lunacy. For some, there's little choice but to add to the growing numbers on Mumbai's roads, especially for Maduka. <laughs> Making a living means doing whatever will bring in the money. And here, cars mean cash. Back in Los Angeles, it's a similar story. And when a star needs to be driven, Deborah has a car. If you live here in LA, you're going to lose 30% 30 30 of your life, life in sitting in traffic. Right. But she knows that here, going green is the fashionable way forward. Would I like to have a, 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 a clean a, a, and economic, what do they call a green friendly car? Yes, because the entertainment of Hollywood is going towards all green cars. When you have the big shows, now the, most of the green cars are small cars. So you see the clients coming up in little Toyotas and little Focuses or, you know, these little small cars. Los Angeles is the center of a state which lays claim to being America's greenest. Once a city whose reputation was inextricably linked to that of the automobile, LA now has the chance to drive the world in a new direction. Because while climate change will affect every city on our planet, unlike every other city, Los Angeles has money, might, and an unwavering belief in happy endings. How Los Angeles chooses to adapt to climate change could affect millions around the world. Because whatever LA does, the world will always be watching. The issues that LA faces are broadcast to the world, and they're somewhat acute here because of our size and because of our environment. And then from those challenges comes the opportunities to develop the strategies and the technologies to confront that. We're sort of on the lead of these large 20th century sprawling cities, and hopefully we can provide the knowledge to help others to get through those challenges, or better yet, to avoid them to begin with. These are challenges which must be faced. Around the world, climate change is a reality. Unless world leaders and nations act, a global catastrophe could be on the cards. And despite their size, despite what they have done to hasten global warming, perhaps the answers start with cities sharing solutions. This is how we are going to solve climate change tomorrow. Live a little more like a community, not just within a city, but within a country, not just within a country, but between continents. It is one home, just one small blue planet.